possible by a generous grant from Maryland Humanities. We're very grateful for their continued partnership in our programs, all of which are also supported by donors like you. According to documentation that we have about Kate Sharper, she was brought to the farm in the year 1751 at the age of eight. We have adjusted her age in our stories to account for the ages of the actors who portray her and her family. All we know about Kate Sharper is her name and that she was enslaved on this land. We know that she had a son and we know that the owners had another enslaved little boy named Jack. Sadly, he died in a smallpox outbreak. The stories we have created are to share what happened to innumerable families during the era of chattel slavery in this country. This presentation is part two of our Sharper family series. After the video and the conversation, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answer session. You're welcome to, to type your questions in the chat box. Some of the questions will be answered by Akakeek staff members and some of the questions will be answered on camera. We now present to you the reunion of Kate and Jack. Your aunt, my baby sister, Mary Ann, found me after, after so many years. And by happenstance, she met your father, Tom, at a market, at, I believe they said in Baltimore. He told her that you had been apprenticed to a leatherman and that, that you may have a chance to come here when your master came down on business. I had hope. But I never truly believed that you would come. Tell me, is he good to you? Master Hyde treats me well. Thanks to my master lending me out to him, I have been able to learn a lot more skills that put me ahead of most. I've been able to learn tanning work, and as such, I've been able to send you your jumps. It makes me happy to see that they fit you so well and serve you so nicely. Wearing them makes me feel like you are close to my heart. But tell me, is tanning, is tanning nearly as bad as growing tobacco? <laughs> oh, tanning is, is a good skill to learn, but it, it is foul. 
foul worse than even picking hornworms from tobacco. Tis not possible. Oh. Nothing is worse than picking hornworms. Well, <laughs> in the wintertime, my skin cracks, and the smell of the leather and the tanning, it just it sticks to your hair and to your clothes, even after you wash. But it's still, tis a wonderful skill to learn. Does your master pay you? Do you get to keep any of the money, or does it, does it go back just to him? I actually am able to make money through the work that I do. I, um, though I am not a free man, I am able to pretend to be one. No. Oh, I have heard that you found favor. You're always such a good boy. I remember how you would jump from rafter to rafter and nearly make my heart stop, but though, though wild at times, always so obedient such a good heart. I'm so pleased to see you and to know that you are doing so well. Tell me, how long, how long are you able to stay? Well, Mr. Hyde, he goes to Piscataway Town for about a week, so that's how I'm able to be here. But with the money that I have recently earned, I was hoping to have saved up enough to have earned back your freedom. Hopefully you'd be able to join me in possibly being freer than you currently are. I want you to keep your money. Your father and I are, are tending to his tobacco. I, I steal away at night after they have all gone to sleep. Our hope is that by selling his tobacco, we can save that money and buy your freedom. You are a man now, and I want nothing more in this life but for you to be free like your father and not continue to be a slave like me. If I get my freedom in the future, then so be it. But every mother wants better for her child than she has had for herself. I am, I am so grateful that you have the chance to learn a skill that will further you in life. So grateful that you are talented and that you have found favor. You have your whole life ahead of you. You need to be free. So you keep the money that you have earned and your father will get the other money to you. And as a family, we will ensure your freedom. Your freedom means the world to me. But mom, I I want to be able to earn your freedom, too. I know. I know. My son. But as a family, we will go forward through you. I'm just so pleased and so thankful to see you. When I saw you going down that river when they sold you off, my heart broke. I thought I would die right then and there, and I didn't care if I lived, but knowing that you are well, that you have found favor, and that you have this skill that will give you a better chance at life is more than I could have ever hoped and dreamed for. I want you to be happy and free. Start your own family. That is all that I need. Just to see you again makes my heart sing and it gives me hope that better days are ahead. Now, it's been a long time. Let me fix you something to eat and, and put together a salve so that you may take with you. Protect your hands and your skin during the winter. Thank you, Mom. Tis the happiest day of my life. will always be my baby boy, my son. Come, let's go inside.
I'd like to take this time to thank my fellow staff member, Sarah McAndrew, for the wonderful music she composed for both pieces, Sisters Forever and the reunion of Kate and Jack, as well as an earlier piece that we did for Juneteenth. She did all of the filming and the editing. Thank you, Sarah. Now I am pleased to take this time to introduce to you the young actor who portrayed Jack Sharper, my own son, Deldridge Berry II. He is a senior at Mount St. Mary's University and he is a double major in communications and theater. Welcome, Deldridge. Hi. <laughs> Deldridge, I, first of all, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come down and film the reunion of Kate and Jack with me and for being a part of the Zoom presentation. Can you share with our audience a little bit about why you chose or why you were willing to portray Jack Sharper? Well, I feel as though growing up in, in the current time and going to school, they don't teach a lot about slavery and the things that have happened in history. And I feel this had given me an opportunity to not only learn more about things that I was not properly educated on, but I feel as though really everyone should just be educated on it as the entire experience I've gained so much and I've learned so much. And it's something that if I could, I would definitely do it again. I would just do it as many times as I could, as I keep finding new and more exciting things um, that have happened in history and through the entire storytelling process. So with that, would you say that your experiences as a young man in the 21st century influenced how you approached portraying Jack? Yeah, when I, when I looked at the script and I looked at the entire story that is being told, it is something that in the current day and age, just to be separated from you uh, would break my heart in any type of way. And I know that if same circumstances, I know I would fight and work to earn your freedom. The story hit very close to home for me and I could just see myself actually being Jack in the entire story. And it just connected me more and more to the characters because of it. I'm glad you brought that up about the parallels between how you would feel in that time period compared to today. As a mother in the 21st century, thinking about how Kate and Jack were separated and how numerous families were torn apart, I have my own concerns and apprehension whenever you and I are away from each other. Um, the climate of the times are such that being a young black man in this nation is very dangerous. And just like Kate had to be concerned about losing her family and losing her son, not knowing what was going to happen to him, not knowing if she would ever see him again. There have been times when I've been very hesitant to, as I watch you grow up, because I don't know, nobody knows what tomorrow holds. And I just have to believe that, that you will be protected and that you will be safe. But as, as a mother, I can empathize with what Kate was feeling, not knowing the whereabouts of her child, not knowing what his future would hold because of who he was because of the climate of the times, by not having any of the freedoms or the choices to be able to stop the sale of her son. Um, just the helplessness that she had to have felt is something that I think about when I bring her to life. And it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk about your experiences, how you would see that. Um, With a lot of the, the movement that has been going on, the Black Lives Matter and a lot of the protests that have been happening in the world, how does participating in interpretation shape 
how you look at what is happening now? It, it makes the entire movement uh, mean even more so to me since I have been able to go back and see what certain slaves have gone through and how far we have come and how far we still are from really achieving um, just true peace overall. I feel as though going in with what I said earlier, not a lot of kids are taught about these things in school. And I think that's one of the biggest driving motions with the movement as well, that more people need to be educated on the past. More people need to be educated on what's really right and wrong, why things need to change and why we can't, why we can't repeat history, essentially. And being able to perform as the role of Jack has given me more of a broader look on everything as a whole. Um, it isn't just me looking at the things that I'm going through in the current 21st century. I'm looking at what everyone has gone through through the different years, how much it's changed, how much it hasn't changed. Um, and there's still a lot of things that are very much ingrained in our society that I hope that the movement can help um, really shed light on everything. Yes, it is time for a change. It is 2020 and many times, even this year, it seems like we haven't taken the steps necessary to move further through the civil rights movement than when it first started. It seems like things are well and then another pocket of, of trials and another pocket of discord rises up. And we see that as far as we have come, we haven't come as far as we should have. It means a great deal to me that you are willing to make yourself uncomfortable Wearing wool in the dead of summer is not the most pleasant experience, mm -hmm. but that you are willing to learn about your history firsthand and that you are able to go back and talk to your peers and is express to them how important it is for them to know about our history. Chattel slavery was one of the darkest periods of this nation's history. And too often, nobody wants to talk about it. They treat slavery like it's a four letter word and they are afraid to even say it in their homes, in mixed company, in our schools. For those of you who, who may not know, I started interpreting when Deldridge was in kindergarten. I told his teacher that I wanted to participate in his education, but I didn't want to be that mom that sat in the back of the classroom to watch the students when she went to take care of personal errands. And so she said, well, how would you like to be involved? And in that moment, I said, I can dress up as any historical figure that you would like and come and tell their story. And she said, I will take you up on that. And she did. And that was over 15 years ago. And I've had the joy and the honor and the privilege of bringing various historical figures to life. And I asked my children recently, what did they learn about slavery in school? What did they learn about the civil rights movement in school? And all three of them looked me in the face and said, only what you've taught us, mom. And as an interpreter, as an educator, it encouraged me. But as a parent, it frustrated me. 
because if my own children were not able to learn this in their schools, and if I had not taken the time to educate them, they wouldn't be as aware of their history as they are. And I can't be everywhere and I can't go to every school. And we need as a nation to be able to talk about those dark parts of history so that we can learn from them. And if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Delders, thank you so much for taking this time to have this conversation with me. Now we would like this opportunity to allow you to ask questions. If you have posed questions in the chat and they have not been addressed in the chat, we will address them on camera. And if you have not thought of a question so far, but one comes to mind in the midst of this next question and answer session, feel free. If the questions cannot be addressed on camera or in the chat, we will note your name and we do have your email address and we will get that answer and information to you as soon as possible via email. But there doesn't seem to be any questions at the moment. <laughs> so Deldridge, as you go forward with your um, college education, you're a senior this year in communications and theater, what are some of your aspirations? Do you, has this experience influenced the majors that you've chosen? Uh, yes, heavily. Um, originally when I started college, I didn't truly know what I wanted to do with my life at the end of it. Um, but as I've gotten older, um, the more you've educated me through the years and being able to be a part of this whole process, um, it has led me to find my calling of journalism. Um, and especially with everything going on in the world, just everything. I want to be able to deliver the news in, in an unbiased fashion. I see that, I mean, take the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, for example. Um, a lot of news stations want to not necessarily report on all the positives of the movement. I want to be able to deliver their message, deliver everyone's message all around the globe, no matter who you are, in such an unbiased light to educate people so that they know what's happening around the world, what's happening in people's lives, and how much it's affecting everybody. I see I just want to be able to make a difference, seeing as how when a lot of things are going wrong, a lot of people look to the news to be informed to see what's happening. And not all news outlets are unbiased as others. So I just want to be able to change the game the best that I can. That's, that's admirable. I think we do have a question. Is it known whether Tom and Kate were ever able to buy Jack's freedom? The question was, is it known whether Tom and Kate were ever able to buy Jack's freedom? The story that we tell about Jack being sold is a story that happened to too many families to even name. We don't know what happened to Kate or Tom or their son. Since I've been here at the Akakik Foundation, they have told the story of Jack being Kate's son to acknowledge the little boy who passed away from the smallpox outbreak. We would hope that they would have been able to save the money to purchase Jack's freedom, but that is not something that we have any type of definitive proof about. What did Kate and Jack mean when they said freer than you are currently? The question is, what did Kate and Jack mean by saying freer than you are currently? In the story that we were telling with Jack, by him being lent out to another person who was a Leatherman, he was given the opportunity to move about because he had gained favor, meaning 
his master lent him out because he trusted him. And the man who he was lent to also saw that he was trustworthy. They were not afraid of him running away. And so they gave him liberties. He was able to, to keep some of the money that was paid for the leather work that he was done. He was given the opportunity to come visit his mother when the person that he was being leased to, for lack of a better term, had business down in this area. We know through some of our research that there were times when those who were enslaved were given liberties. They were able to move about a little more freely. They were able to earn money. It did not mean that they were free. They could not just completely leave. They still had to report back in at certain times. And maintaining that level of responsibility, reporting back in when they were told to, relinquishing the money that they had earned to their masters or to whoever was in, in control of them at that moment. It gave those in authority a sense of trust and they would allow some of their enslaved people to move about in a manner when Jack said, although he was not free, he was able to pretend that he was free because in that era, you would have to have permission to leave the farm. You would have to have documentation with you that said that you were allowed to be where you were. And so that is what they meant by saying freer than they were. So Del, you spoke of how this experience of Jack Carroll, how you fight to find your mom. How has this experience shaped any other parts of your day-to-day -day life? And you may have already answered it. It has been able to make me a more empathetic human um, through everything. It helps me really take a walk in other people's shoes. Um, through the life that I've been able to live, uh, just like anyone else, I've had ups and downs. But being a part of this whole process, I could now just interact with people differently and have a better understanding of the troubles that they're going through or the troubles that they have faced in their past. Um, it has just overall made me look at the world a lot differently than before I was able to portray Jack. Tanning was a denigrated industry like perhaps garbage collector today. How typical was the portrayal in the script? Would the mother not know about the reputation of tanning? Would Jack have been able to buy his freedom from gaining money in that work? The question is, would Jack have been able to gain enough money from tanning by it being one of, a, one of the lower forms of, of work in that time period? Depending on his level of skill and the types of products that he was able to produce would influence how much the owners would be able to charge for it. So a basic tanner, if the skill level was lower, may not generate that much revenue, <clears throat> but if he was a skilled artisan, and was able, if there was a way that they could charge more, then it, would, it could have been possible for him to save the money to earn his freedom. It's unclear during the 1700s how much his freedom would have been. It's also unclear if the price would have changed. In some of our research that, that I have found that took place in the 1800s, there would be times when someone who was enslaved would have earned money and saved their money to purchase their freedom. And then the price that they were quoted would be changed. 
we don't know and we didn't go into depth in the story for, of how long Jack would have to save money, how long he had been tanning or how long he would have been lent out. But we shared those aspects in the story to educate the community that there were times when people who were enslaved were able to be paid a portion of the money that went back to their owners. Often in the little bit of history that we are taught about chattel slavery, we are led to believe that there was never an opportunity for freedom unless you ran, that there was never an opportunity to earn money that there was never an opportunity to learn an additional skill besides picking tobacco or picking cotton. And so while it wasn't a prominent position or skill set that he was learning, we wanted to show that there were differences in some enslaved people's experiences. Tom must have been growing his own tobacco on a nearby farm. Is it known where? Did he own the land? Do we know what happened to Tom? The question is, in short, what happened to Tom and how he was growing his own tobacco. In the previous series that we, the previous episode of the Sharper Family series, we discussed that Tom was a free man. And by him being free, coming to the farm, he was able to be paid a small wage because he was not owned. In the stories that we tell with Kate Sharper and dealing with Tom, we share that the family that owned her lost a lot of money and they were unable to continue to pay Tom. So Tom found another plantation owner or farmer who was willing to rent land to him and allow him to grow tobacco on his land. And then they would divvy up a portion of the money from selling that tobacco. And so telling that portion of the story, we wanted to highlight that there were people who were black, who were free in the 1700s. It's not often talked about, as mentioned in the video, there was a community of free Blacks in the Baltimore area. And we wanted to acknowledge those people through the character of Tom. Will you speak more about the difference between skilled labor versus unskilled labor and more about what kind of work there is evidence of enslaved people doing in the area? The question is to discuss more about unskilled labor versus skilled labor. Unskilled labor would be Kate tending to the tobacco, pulling off those horrible hornworms. Skilled labor would be being taught a specific trade, being taught how to take the hides from an animal and fashioning it into a piece that is functional for the protection or the enjoyment of people. So the, the garment that, the leather pieces that I was wearing in the video presentation dressed as Kate are called jumps. It is a combination of, it's a vest corset combination in modern terminology. And so that is not something that you would just know how to do. Kate wouldn't just be able to go and take an animal hide and turn it into the leather and do the tanning and the drying and the sewing of it to make a garment unless she had been taught like Jack had been. So that is the difference between an unskilled laborer and a skilled laborer. It is 1240. We have time for a few more questions. If anybody else would like to, to enter one into the chat box. 
What's a hornworm? Several references to it in the presentation. Just curious what exactly that is. That is. How does it affect the crops? Ah, so the question is, what is a hornworm? <laughs> a hornworm is actually a caterpillar. It can grow to be about this long, and it's the same color green as the tobacco leaves. They have one horn at the top of their head. It is yellow and black stripes that go down the um, caterpillar's body. Tobacco leaves themselves are very sticky, and hornworms will cling to the tobacco leaves and eat the tobacco leaves. You've got to pull them off and remove them from the plant. And often it's recommended that you squish them so that they do not crawl back to the tobacco plant and eat the tobacco. Um, they can destroy an entire leaf. They can destroy an entire plant in a matter of days. Um, flea beetles will attack the plant when it is a young seedling but the hornworms are more dangerous to it when it becomes an adult plant. Um, many of our attendees may not have experience with tobacco plants, but if you have ever grown tomatoes, the caterpillars that eat the tomato plants are in the same family as the caterpillars that eat the, to the tobacco. So if you've ever seen a hornworm on a tomato, you've pretty much seen the same type of hornworm that would be on a tobacco plant. Um, they can be, they are very difficult to remove from the tobacco leaves because the leaves themselves are sticky and they, as I said, they cling to them. And so if you don't pull them off in the right manner, you will have the unpleasant experience of the hornworm sharing everything that it has eaten all over your hand. That's the nicest way that I can put it. <laughs> what trials did free blacks face during the time period or how were their lives similar or different from enslaved people's lives? Can you say that one more time? Yeah. Um, what trials did free blacks face during the time period and how were their lives similar or different from enslaved people's, basically? The question is, what were the differences between being a free black person and an enslaved black person? Being free, you would have the opportunity to earn your own money. You could come and go as you please, but there were still restrictions and limitations. There were some places where the laws were that a free person could not stay in certain areas for too long. Obviously, if you are enslaved, you are in bondage, you have no say so in what happens to you or to your family. So with Kate being enslaved and her husband being free, any child that they would have was enslaved because of the status of the mother. So if Tom had been enslaved, but Kate was free, Jack would have been born free. As an enslaved person, Kate had no choice when, in our storyline, the flea beetle destroyed over half of the family's crop, and to recoup the money to purchase more seed, they chose to sell some of their property. And some of the property in our storyline that they chose to sell was Jack. It did not matter how heartbroken Kate was. It did not matter how much she fought or did not want her son to be taken and sold away, she had no choice because she had no voice. Being a free black, you have, they had more of a voice than those who were enslaved, but they did not have the same rights or freedoms that someone who was white had. There was still the fear of being captured and sold into slavery. And while being free, they did not have to worry about their families being separated. There was a point in time in history where you had to be able to prove your freedom. And if you lost control of your freedom papers, you lost control of your freedom. 
So being a free black person during the era of slavery was still dangerous. It was never an opportunity to fully relax and to fully breathe. Sadly, much like it is today, there are instances and times in this nation and around the world where having black skin does not guarantee you peace of mind. There are concerns and fears that people who are black have, that people who are white do not have. And that is as simple and as honest as I can say. So we bring these stories to life to honor those who have been lost to history, their stories who have been lost, their names who have been lost, but it is important to talk about them, to say all of their names, because they were people and they existed and they lived and they breathed. And for that, they should be respected as the humans that they were. And we tell those stories to show that as much as times have not changed, We can hope for a better future. We can strive for a better future. And we all need to remember, we all have a place in this world. And there is nobody who is more important than anyone else. And just as those who were free in the 1700s and the 1800s wanted a better life for themselves, just as those who were enslaved wanted a better life for themselves, we all want better for ourselves and better for our children and future generations to come. You all are so amazing. What is next for Jack and Kate story-wise and in afterlife? <laughs> the question is, well, thank you for the compliment uh, that we are amazing. The question is, what is next for Kate and Jack? This is our last virtual museum theater presentation for the summer. We will be continuing to do further research and finding new and inventive ways to tell the story of Kate and Jack and Tom and the Bolton family, which is the fictional family that represents many of the colonists that lived in this area, as well as bringing to life the stories of Piscataway people. And as we don't know what COVID is going to do, with the rest of this year and into next year and how that will affect our programming. We, we as a programming team within the Akakik Foundation are dedicated to finding ways to bring these stories to life, to share with the community and those outside of our community. Throughout this pandemic, we have gained many new friends of Akakik from Maine to California to Alaska. And while this pandemic has been very challenging and how we educate the communities, surprisingly, it has opened up a lot more windows so that we can share the information and we've gained more friends. As far as our personal acting lives, uh, the pandemic has affected a lot of theaters. And so many shows that Deldridge and I may have been a part of this year or even next year are postponed. But in this new age of Zoom and our, the technology that we are all learning how to navigate, there are many opportunities that are presenting themselves to allow us to share our artistic performances. So stay tuned.
And we also encourage you to follow us on the Akakik Foundation page on Facebook and akakikfoundation.org to find out more of our events and programs as we prepare for the end of 2020 going into 2021. When a free man of color purchased his wife or children, was he able to free them and was that freedom upheld in practice? The question is when a free man of color purchased his family, was he able to free them and was it upheld? That is a very interesting question. By them purchasing their freedom, for some, they had the choice to do the a manumission to give them their freedom. I would imagine that many of them did. It is unclear if keeping them, keeping them as enslaved people protected them more or not. As I said, being a free person, a free black person came with its own set of challenges because there were still laws that minimized their their ability to move about as freely as their white counterparts. But there were many, many instances where people would purchase their families to protect them, to save them, and to keep them from being sold away to someone else and not knowing where they are and losing contact with their families altogether. It is 12.52, we have time for one more question. Maybe two. Do you both do any other historical interpretations for family? The question is, does our family participate in other historical interpretations? I do. Um, I have had the opportunity in the past to portray various historical women and when those opportunities pre present themselves in other theaters and other organizations, I embrace those opportunities to bring other historical figures to life. Beautiful Shamika and Yell. Shamika, thank you for educating us all, not only on Cape Shepherd, but on our current struggles as well. Much love to you both and your Active Geek Foundation for bringing this needed material to the forefront. Yell, are you going to use your journalism skills to interview your mom and write her story? <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, that is one of my goals in life, is that uh, with all the different things that my mother is a part of and the way she is going about educating so many different people. My hope is that one day she will be educating a specific group of people uh, and word will give way and I will be able to tell her story and essentially spread more awareness on the education that my mother is giving to everybody else. We also have a personal goal of one day being the first mother and son dual Tony, Emmy, or Oscar nominees. So stay tuned for that in the future. <laughs> well, we thank you all so much for joining us for this presentation of the reunion of Kate and Jack. Your interest and support in these museum theater programs is important, and we will continue to tell these difficult stories and stories from other cultures in the future. If we know our history and learn from it, we can work together to create a better future for our communities. Keep learning, keep educating. Together, we can all make a difference. We ask that you please check out our website, www.akakeekfoundation.org, to see other programs and events, or like our Facebook page, The Akakeek Foundation. You will all receive a copy of this presentation via email. We'd again like to thank the Maryland Humanities for co-hosting this event with us, and thank you all again for coming. Have a great day.
see that happen. Thank <clears throat> you. 